Yeah, you never know what you're going to find when you start looking on the internet. Sometimes you find some good stuff, and other times you find stuff you just darn near should just stay away from, and anything in between. But I did find some interesting thoughts on various aspects of life I'd like to share with you. Some things uh, just pertaining to different, different parts of our lives. And pertaining to the field of medicine, I told the doctor that I was concerned about my recent loss of memory, and he made me pay in advance. <laughs> now pertaining to the field of relationships, best friend's definition, ready to die for each other, but we'll fight to the death over the last slice of pizza. <laughs> and pertaining to the field of health and wellness, diet, day one. I removed all the fattening food from my house. It was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> pertaining to the workplace, my job is very secure. No one else wants it. <laughs> pertaining to the field of philanthropy, whatever you do, always give 100%. Unless, of course, you're donating blood. <laughs> and last thing from the world of animals. Dog has an owner. Cat has a staff. <laughs> and squirrels, squirrels always act like it's their very first day of being a squirrel. <laughs> you know that's true. If you see that. Okay, so I'm going to move into the message. And what I'd like to do today is... Um, Try to um, come up with some thoughts. I've tried to come up with some thoughts out of Psalm 111. I'd like to read Psalm 111, if we might. So you might turn there, and I'll make a couple comments while you're turning there, and we'll go ahead and read that together. Um, Psalm is about praising the Lord, the works of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and um, all that. So we'll see uh, where we get in another 30 minutes or so. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All of his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have given us your word. It is accurate. It is pure. It is inerrant. And we can rely upon it, Lord. And as we uh, communicate with you through prayer and we read your word, God, we, we can draw close to you. We can come into maturity. We can be more like you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the living word, Jesus who became flesh and became a man that he might live the perfect life and give his life as an offering for the sins of the world. Pray that uh, whatever I say today, Lord, would just um, be from your heart, God. And, uh, I just ask that uh, your word would be correctly um, brought forth today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so let's go verse through verse through this psalm. Uh, Teaching today is not going to be anywhere near exhaustive, and I don't intend it to be. I don't think we can ever fully exhaust the Word of God uh, through one setting, and definitely not even in a lifetime. God is always showing us new things. You know, about the time I look at a passage, hey, I think I got this figured out. You know, a few days go by, and God says, well, what about this? Did you think about this? What about that? Ponder that for a minute. It's like, yeah, I don't have it figured out yet. But I'm getting there, you know, moving through. And it's just a day-by-day -day thing that we can process and apply to make our lives uh, more like Him and to bring us closer into the image of Christ. 
So just, uh, just see what kind of highlights I can come up with uh, the verses and make an attempt to expound upon them. Verse 1, I will praise the Lord, or excuse me, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. <clears throat> so the psalmist here opens the psalm rightly, but, but rightly so by praising and exalting God. We see in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus begins the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. But what a way to open a prayer. I mean, we honor God. We recognize him for who he is. We don't uh, just, this is so easy to just jump right to our needs because sometimes we're in needy people and sometimes we're in pain. Sometimes we're just um, really earthly and really materialistic, whatever. But we really need, I need, we all need, I need to open my prayers with just thankfulness to God. You know, we just, how thankful we need to be to Him. And I, I fail at that too many times and I want to be better. Um, but numerous Psalms, Psalms 22, verse 23, Psalm 40, verse 3, Psalm 139, verse 14, as well as a lot of other scriptures, acknowledge God by offering praise and thanksgiving to Him. And I think we would be wise to direct our praise to Him as well with our whole hearts, leaving our cares and our burdens behind, and we give full attention to Him, even if just for a little bit. Verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Here the psalmist begins his discourse on the works of the Lord. He opens with a statement, fairly general but profound, Great are the works of the Lord. And this idea is also brought forth in Psalms 46, verse 8, where it says the works of the Lord are great. It's mentioned a couple times. I think it bears, uh, bears out that we should pay attention to it. He makes sure that uh, he mentions that those who delight in God's works will study them. We should study them. If we, we find out we, what we love, we spend time with, you know, whether it's people or things or whatever. You just you look at your own life. I look at my own life. We, we do. We spend time with what we love. So let's, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to spend time in God's word and studying it. And I want my love for God to grow. There's always room for growth, and, and all of us are at different areas, but let's grow together. That's what we're a body for. Charles Spurgeon, a great uh, teacher, made this commentary on this verse. He said that man's works are noble from a distance, and God's works are great when they're sought out. I thought that was really good. Verse 3 says, Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. So the psalmist now begins to expand and expound on those works of God. Using such words such as splendor and majesty to describe God's works, the psalmist connects God and his works together, and we see God himself is described with these words. For example, Job 37.22 tells us that God is clothed with majesty. Psalm 29.4 tells us that the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Psalm 96 verse 6 says that the splendor and majesty are before him. While Psalm 96 verse 9 tells us to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And verse 4 says, we, or He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. So here the psalmist begins to bring God's works down to a human level of understanding. And we note that God himself causes his works to be remembered. For example, you go outside on a clear, dark night, and you can observe the starry host of heaven. Or you can view a small piece of this great universe through either a telescope or a microscope. And at either end of that spectrum, we find that we see God's work whether it be a far off galaxy or a little bitty tiny microorganism that we can't see either with the naked eye, but aided by a telescope or a microscope, we're able to see that and those things are visible to us, not to mention all the things around us, uh, as a reminder of his works and also his glory. Psalms 8 verse 3 says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers. 
Psalm 139, 13 tells us that you created my innermost being, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. His works are worthy to be remembered for, by man because um, God himself is worthy, and his works should be remembered. By their remembrance, man is commanded and obligated to praise and worship God. If we were to follow God's words in just the Psalms, I think we'd spend a lot more time praising and worshiping Him. And praising and worshiping Him, by the way, is not somebody standing up here. That's part of it. Praising and worshiping God is making a choice. When you're roofing and you get the wrong nail with the hammer, you can curse or you can bless. It's real easy to curse, tell me I've done it. Um, somebody cuts you off in the driving down the road, and it's really easy to get angry. I've done that. But it's a choice. But it's a matter of making the right choice by um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's a matter of making the right choice of praising him. We we get to choose to praise him. We can praise him anytime we want. And, and, you know, I can choose to either be down in the mouth and grumpy or angry about things, or I can choose to be praising and worshiping Him and honoring Him in that way. And, and I would I would choose to do so. And all too often, I let my own flesh get in the way, so I need to stop that. So, furthermore, God is gracious. He is merciful. He's gracious. That is, He is full of grace, which is unearned merit or favor, and His goodness is to those who have no claim on nor expectation of divine favor. He's merciful as well. He doesn't punish us for our sins, but he has meted out already our punishment on Christ. And we receive this mercy when we repent of our sin and accept Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. Psalm 103, verses eight through 10 say, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor will he repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 5 says, He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Yeah. And now moving into something even more tangible that we as humans can more easily understand and hopefully appreciate, Psalmist turns his attention to the practicality of God and that he provides food for his own, for those who fear him. And I'm thinking this might have a bit of a dual meaning. Uh, seems like greater minds than mine have spoken this, and I'll just uh, kind of bring out what I found. The first meaning is uh, the very literal translation of that, speaking of physical food. He does provide uh, food for us as we need. You know, Benjamin shared last week in his message, that God does provide for our needs, not necessarily all of our wants, because all of our wants aren't necessarily in line with His will for us. But God is faithful, totally faithful, in providing for what we need. And He's very good at that. Psalm 37, 5 tells us that, Never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging for bread. First Timothy tells us that, If we have food and clothing, we should be content. Now, the second meaning, uh, I, I believe, is, I think, speaking of a spiritual food. Note that the psalmist says, God provides for those who fear him. And going back to what Charles Spurgeon said, in his exposition on this verse, God's word is as nourishing to the soul as bread is to the body. And there is such an abundance of it that no heir of heaven shall ever be famished. That's, that's really good. God is very faithful providing not only our physical needs here while we're in this body, but our spiritual needs too, so that we will grow and become more like Him. Now pertaining to Him, remembering His covenant forever, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should change His mind. Has He said, and will He not do it? Has He spoken? Will he not fulfill it? Yeah. Rhetorical question, of course. Yes, he will. Verse 6 says, He has shown his people the power of his yeah. works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. We can observe here that God's works are not modest, 
not cautious, nor are they trivial. Not modest, for who can say that anything God does isn't powerful and awesome? Not cautious in the sense that since God knows exactly what he's doing and he never makes a mistake, he can execute a plan full on with nary a fear of it ever going off kilter. And not trivial. What sane person could ever mistake God or his works as being trivial, except perhaps a fool? No, his works have power behind them, and he will accomplish his plans. I mean, for example, when was the last time any of us went out and spoke our own little universe into existence? Or even, even the tiniest little atom? You know, I, I can't even do that. It can't be done. Yet God does. In Genesis 1, we see clearly that he spoke the universe into existence. And that's some kind of power. Or even better yet, who else has the power to forgive a man's sin? Jesus stated in Luke, 20, Luke 5, verses 21 through 24, that he has the power to forgive sins. It was basically declaring himself on equal footing with God the Father. Because he is equal with God because he is God. Jesus was one with the Father in John 10, 30. Jesus is God eternally. So verses 7 and 8 say, The works of his hands are faithful and just. All of his precepts are trustworthy. They are, they are established forever and forever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. So now we begin to see the true nature of God. His works are faithful, trustworthy, and eternal, carried out with faithfulness and uprightness, a reflection of who God himself is. Psalm 19, verse 7 and following says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant born. In keeping of them, there is great reward. Verse 9 says that he sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Perhaps one of God's greatest works is the redemption of his people. And this is demonstrated in uh, the Old Testament where God sent redemption to the Israelites when they were in Egypt as slaves. He secured their freedom so that he could lead them to the promised land and establish them in that land. Psalm 78, well, somewhere around verse 12, starts to tell us uh, some of the works that God did in redeeming his people from Egypt. He performed wonders in Egypt. He divided the sea so they could pass through. He led them with a cloud by day and a fire by night, protecting them. He caused water to flow from the rock, again, providing for their physical, natural needs that they had. He provided the manna from heaven, something to eat, just to name a few things. And that psalm, that psalm is also replete with Israel's disobedience and stubbornness, and how God over and over and over forgave them until at some point they went too far and found themselves under God's judgment. We don't want to go there. Um, we're very grateful for what God has done for us. Yeah. Just all the more reason for us to praise and worship Him. Yeah. So His covenant has been established with them forever. Now how much greater is it that God has also provided redemption for, our, for those um, uh, who through faith would believe on the Son of God for the remission of sins? His covenant with us is everlasting one as well. Hebrews 10, 12 through 14 says that this priest, Jesus, had offered for one time, for all time, one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. 
And the last part of verse 9 says, Holy and awesome is his name. When I read verses like that, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to a couple of different scriptures. One is in Genesis 15, 5 through 21, where God cuts the covenant with Abram. He makes him the father of many nations. When I think about the way that's written, I, just, I see the holiness of God. There's a certain reverence, even a bit of dread, comes over me when I read that because that is awesome. I, mean, I don't know how you can read that scripture and not be affected by it. It just, it just does for me. Because it just really shows how awesome and powerful our God is. The lengths he has gone to and is willing to go to for his people. Abraham went on to receive God's promise. And he made a lot of mistakes along the way, kind of like us. And yet it was here, in this passage, where God credits Abram for his faith. And says, you know, he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. It wasn't his works, it was his faith. And I would like to challenge you guys, if you have time, read Genesis 15. You can read the whole chapter, but basically 5 through 21. And see what God might speak to your hearts about that. Now the other scripture, um, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In a vision, God is shown to Isaiah in all his splendor and glory in the temple. Isaiah was terrified and recognized his own unworthiness. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips before such an awesome and holy God. But yet God cleansed his lips and he commissioned him to do his work. So you might want to look at that and study that out. But I'd like to just read a little bit, if you don't mind, of Isaiah 6, verse 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. One of the seraphim then flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. I hear the voice of the, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. There's two very powerful scriptures that I think deserve some study and some thought and prayer about. So that brings us to our last verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding, and his praise endures forever. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5 say, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to worship, excuse me, to wisdom, and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find knowledge of God. We have to receive God's word. In other words, are we convinced that God's word is wisdom and it is to our benefit to receive it, we're not convinced, don't waste your time. But I would caution you, you might want to ask God if you're not convinced to convince you, he will, he's faithful. We must treasure up his commandments by hiding them in our hearts. It's not enough to receive the word, we must also retain it by hiding it in our hearts and keep from sinning. It takes a lot of work to make our ears attentive to something. Everything around us vies for our attention, and we must be diligent. Do we eagerly yearn to hear God's word taught to us? Or 
maybe that program or that map or some sporting event or whatever else fits your bill would take place. Living in this world, it's easy to let that stuff get all over me. I try not to, but it, it does. And all we can do is move on and hopefully listen to God better next time. <clears throat> So upon hearing the word of the Lord, we must train our hearts to lean towards that good word. Like a plant tends to lean towards the sunshine, our hearts must lean towards the warmth and the, fair, and the spiritual photosynthesis, if you will, to make us grow strong and healthy. We can't very well lean on our own understanding and the world's understanding and expect to receive much from God. It's not that he would be wasting his time, I don't want to go there. But it's just you're going to wait until we are. Just get that other stuff out of your life. Focus on me. And I'll make you strong and healthy. I'll make you just like that little plant growing up healthy and strong. It needs the sunshine. And we need the sunshine of God. Our hearts do not naturally lean towards the things of God. It takes trust and obedience. I want to say that again. Our hearts do not naturally lean toward the things of God. It takes trust and obedience. The word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. And are we serious about gaining wisdom and understanding the fear of the Lord? Then we must cry out to him for understanding. Faint milk toast prayers and half-hearted supplications aren't going to cut it. How about we get passionate about the things for God for once? How many times does our anger flare off? The jerk who pulled out in front of us in traffic. I mean, times we cursed ourselves because we missed that shot at that bull elk that should have been an easy shot. We missed it and he ran off. And, well, there he goes. How about the time when we were watching a movie and we were brought to tears because the hero had fallen and all hope now seems lost? We're going to a concert experiencing the excitement and the charisma there. Let's try some of that by getting serious with God, if that's what we really want. And let's see how he responds to our cries. And lastly, for that part, are we willing to go to the pain and take the risks of seeking and searching for wisdom? The risks a minor goes to and the pain of backbreaking work must be evaluated alongside of the end result, finding the silver or gold. And who's going to risk that if they're not fairly certain they would receive a return on the investment of risk and pain involved in the venture? So is wisdom and understanding of the fear of the Lord a worthy adventure, a venture for you? I have a couple more scriptures I'd like to read pertaining to the benefits we receive from fearing the Lord. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, By loving kindness and truth, Iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. God's watching us, and one day we will give an account of our lives to him. Proverbs 10, 27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Proverbs 15, 16 tells us that better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Knowing that God will supply all of our needs will help us be content. The Apostle Paul said, I know how to be content in any situation. And Psalm 147, verse 11 says, But the fear, or excuse me, but the word, I'd start that completely over. Psalm 147, 11 says, But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. There's just something that resonates in our souls and in our spirits that we know that God actually takes pleasure in us when we are right before him. That's a neat feeling. God taking pleasure with us. He's not just up there being God and wondering, well, what we'll do today, you know, oh, what's the kids doing today? No, he actually takes pleasure in us. Proverbs 8.13 8, says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. And someone wise once said, we should love the things that God loves, and we should hate the things that God hates. There's a couple more verses about those who have no fear of the Lord. 
Proverbs 1, 29 through 31 says, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, and would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof, therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and they shall have the fill of their own devices. You know, if we wanted our way bad enough, God will oblige. But we're going to discover the bitterness of having our own way. We can, we can go either way. I'd really rather have the blessing. I've had some of that bitterness, and I don't like it. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't feel good. It isn't good. Ecclesiastes 8, chapter 8, verse 13 says, But it will not be well for the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like the lengthening of a shadow, because he does not fear before God. The idea here is that just as a shadow lengthens throughout the day, so a man's life may be lengthened by following God's ways. But no such hope is given for those who insist on their own plans and schemes. And then the psalmist brings it all back around by closing with, His praise endures forever. It seems to me regardless of our lot or our station in life, we're supposed to be praising and worshiping God. Over and over in the psalms alone, not to mention so many other scriptures, we're told to and expected to offer praise to our God. God is so good to us, we sometimes fail to see him in his fullness. Sometimes we want to see this grandfatherly-like figure sitting on his celestial rocking chair, handing out unmerited candy for his favorite grandkids. God's not like that. Sure, he's good. He's kind, he's compassionate. He's full of grace and mercy. But he is also the God who never changes. He's just, he's perfect, he's holy, and he will judge sin. Don't think for a moment that just because Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin, that the Father is now sitting up in heaven winking at our sin, quietly chuckling. It cost Jesus his life. He willingly gave that, but it still cost him his life. That was a very expensive, and yet an expense God was willing and glad to pay. This whole thing was set up before the foundations of the world. That's how good our God is. That's how awesome our God is. It's all the more reason for us to have a healthy fear and reverence for the Lord. I want to close with this little thing. Many of you are familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis and some of his great works. So in C.S. Lewis' classic children's novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, Pevensey. They're transported by Aslan, the lion, to a world called Narnia, which is populated by talking animals. The purpose of bringing them to Narnia, unbeknownst to them, is that of installing them as kings and queens, benevolently ruling over the animals. After their arrival in Narnia, the following exchange takes place between Susan and Lucy and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, shortly before the children are taking, taken to meet Aslan. Is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan, a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he'd be a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most, or just silly. Then he isn't safe, asked Lucy. Safe, Miss, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And God is good. Amen. Amen.